to you for our talk on um, Pecked Bells and Funerary Rites and Remembrance. Over to you, Lulu. Thank you. If I could have the first slide up, please. Can everybody see that? Can you all see that? Yes. Yes. Good. Yes. Okay. Thank is that you. the first slide? No, it's actually the second one, but don't worry, because the first one was just the introdu uh, just um, preliminary slide, so it's fine. Um, as Claire said, uh, I am a part-time artist researcher. I'm doing a PhD um, at UCA Farnham and UAL London jointly on grief and how people process grief and how art and landscape interact in helping pre people process grief. So that's my, my sort of particular interest and why I've got an interest in textiles and funeral rites. I'm a tapestry weaver, but I weave sculptural, sculptural forms and I put them outside in the landscape, usually in um, unconventional places, but we'll come to that a little bit later. As I said in the abstract for this talk, when you think about it, other than skin, textiles are the first and probably the last things we're ever aware of being touched by or touching. And it's probably no wonder that a system of special textiles has been developed, special clothes sometimes, or functional textiles for particular rites of passage. Think of a christening gown or a wedding dress or some of the allegiant textiles, your football club shirt or your band t-shirt or things like that, that mark you out as part of a group. And these are all special. Now, obviously in this talk, I can't be completely comprehensive. Um, you're getting edited highlights of the things that fascinate and interest me, and I hope they will interest and possibly fascinate you as well. You think about the the funeral rites I'm going to be covering are some of the rituals that help people come to terms with and live with the loss. It's not about moving on and forgetting, it's about learning to live with a changed and a new normal, to use that very current phrase. There are also two categories to think about when you're dealing with funeral rites. One is the, the physical body, or as a matter of hygiene, you have to do something with it whether it's cremation or burial or sky burial or, or whatever that may be, something has to be done for hygiene as well as ritual purposes. But you've also got what is known as the social body, the one that you might celebrate and want to remember, or over what, which there might be some conflict or power struggle. You think of the death of Lenin and all the, the shenanigans, for want of a better word, that went on over his body which was both a private body and a social body. If I could have the next slide, please. So thinking about it in terms of the use of textiles, as it said in the previous slide, of uh, in burial for the mourners and perhaps the use of keepsakes and how that might feed into our thinking. This first picture is of some Jewish men praying in their traditional prayer shawls, the tallit. And you can see the fringes on the edges, I hope, which are known as, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce this pro properly. So anyone who knows, please forgive me. And that goes for anything I pronounce wrongly throughout. But I pronounce it as zit, 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 um, the fringes. I think I'll just call them the fringes for here on. As it was told to me by a good friend, when, prayer is happening there's a symbolic wrapping the putting the cloth over the prayer shawl over the head wrapping it round the body as you're praying in your life when a person dies they're buried in a very simple shroud freshly made pure white linen everybody is the same but gentlemen are wrapped in the tallet in the same wrapping as as though they were were praying, but often the fringes are cut to show that the life of earthly prayer is over, but also to symbolize that the deceased is now in the permanent protection of the Almighty. And I think that's really rather a very beautiful picture. I'm going to go on with the next slide to talk about some other rituals from around the world. 
In Tang Dynasty China, pearled roundels of silk were incorporated into face coverings from the dead. They were very heavily embroidered. It was a circle or an oval cartouche bordered with spots and having bird or animal motifs. It wasn't embroidered with the face like some Egyptian and um, Romano Egyptian textiles were, but they were bird or animal motifs showing the influence that was coming from Turkestan and Iran. So very Middle Eastern embroidery on those ones. The Kuba peoples of Central Africa, for them the textile is woven raffia skirts, which are cooperatively made and owned. They form a really important part of funeral ceremonies. There's a lot of negotiation as to what can be buried and what can't, what needs to be kept. And it's to do with being recognized in the afterlife. That's a common thread in a, a lot of burial practices is about being known for who you are. And significantly, even in areas where raffia skirts aren't generally worn in the everyday, they're an absolute must for burial rituals. Uh, if you were, were to wear anything else, it would be as bad as being naked in the people's thinking. Moving on to the Sakalaba people of Madagascar, they do really ornate fine silk burial cloths, which they use and reuse, re-shrouding the ancestors. And it's ritualized as, as a speaking through common people and then silencing by reburial, reflecting the belief that speaking and naming assert the renewal of life and relationships, whereas wrapping up signifies restraint and depersonalization. When someone dies, their body is washed, Pieces of perfumed kapok are placed in the orifices and then the body is wrapped in cloth within a plain wooden coffin, which is then covered with a second white cloth. At that time, the spouse, if there is one, is analogously wrapped in silence and seclusion for up to three months. When that period is over, the end of mourning is announced by dressing in clean clothes, leaving the house and starting to speak to people again. The Trobriand Islanders in Polynesia. The, um, sorry, I lost my place there. The cloth, cloth is valued as much or sometimes more than land and it's actually help, held by the maternal line. And if it's going to be lost, it has to be restored after someone has died. And they use bundles of dried banana leaves and fibrous skirts are made and distributed to the family. And there's a really strict code of relationships. And it includes donations to those who gave things of value to the deceased. Women as are behaving as sisters, exposing and reclaiming for their own families, all that contributed to making the deceased more than they were at their conception. In Papua New Guinea, it's a very uncomfortable ritual for, for the close relatives. Um, the, signet, the pain of loss and grief is signified by plastering the skin with white clay, which puckers and scrapes painfully as it dries. If you imagine a face pack, if any of you have ever done that, and how uncomfortable that is as it dries. And they wear a special bodice made of grey seeds. And it is about mortification of the flesh, about punishment in a way. The widow stays in her house for several months. And when she emerges, it is with a shaven head and skin covered in clay and wearing a special bodice, this special bodice I mentioned. And then after a certain time, this is symbolically removed and disposed of. So just as the body is disposed of, so is the mourning clothing, unlike with some of the other rituals I've mentioned where it's kept and reused. The Iberia, Iberia people of Nigeria, Nigeria are, are now predominantly Muslim with a Christian minority, but most of their social practices retain the pre-Islamic, pre-Christian ritual traditions. All three traditions, of course, presuppose the continuation of existence after death, but 
nothing is ever explained about quite what nature that will take. The Ibira words for person and body are not used about the deceased, and the link between the living and the dead is enacted in masquerade and rite and is manifested by means of cloth. The matrilineage, again, it's a, a woman-centered ritual. They supply cloth with woven stripes in indigo and white, and it's differentiated by gender. This cloth is draped over the doorway to signify the presence of the deceased and is later removed and used to wrap the corpse for burial. The only other use of this cloth is in the clothing of masked performers in a ritual which is interpreted as people returning from the land of the dead and creating a continu continuity with the living. So cloth is a medium for relationship between the deceased and the bereaved. And my final example um, sort of crosses the boundary really between uh, rituals for the living and the dead. When um, a high ranking chief in Fiji dies, there is a period of mourning and at the end of that period, the successor wears hundreds of meters of bark cloth, including a hundred meter train. The volume of cloth adds presence to the wearer, but being bark cloth, its fragility draws atten attention to the vulnerability of both himself and the role he has assumed. And it is always a he. The cloth wraps a person with a symbol of the regeneration of authority, the public body, but also acts as a signal of the difficulty of maintaining the authority and its history. So an example of a continuous social body. You are not just yourself, you are what you represent. If you'd like, if I could have the next slide, please. You can probably guess from these three colours what I'm going to talk about. Uh, about the Victorian mourning rituals, which were very complex and required books in themselves. And I'm just going to give you a little, a little hint, but I would uh, recommend further research if it interests you. The whole point about wearing black wasn't just as black as a color, but because it absorbs light. And as such, certain types of fabric weren't allowed in mourning. Anything that shone, so no silk, no rayon, um, or anything like that would be would be permitted. Um, so that's where you get that wonderful fabric, bombazine, which is a wool fabric or wool cotton mix, possibly, because it completely absorbs the light. When the transition to purple arose, I'm not entirely sure. And whether it was a matter of marketing, because Perkins had found a way to make mauve. So mauve became democratized, purple became democratized, whereas before it came from the shell of a sea snail and in Roman times, only the emperor could wear purple. Uh, but it was democratized by the making of Perkins mauve. And I don't know whether it was clever marketing or the fact that purple traditionally in the Christian church is a penitential color, the color of sorrow and sadness and repentance that it became linked with mourning. And you would move over a period of time from black to purple to lilac or a paler mauve. And you could at the same time move into more light reflective fabrics. So you could go into silk or satin, but still in these subdued colors and still probably with a black trim for quite some time. And there were elaborate uh, guides and hints and tips for mourners as to the timescales and the stages, depending on your proximity of relationship to the, the deceased in order to do decent, as they called it, mourning. I could have the next slide, please. I've just seen something in the chat that someone's not seeing the photos. Or is it just that I only put um, the colors up? So thinking about textiles in remembrance, um, I've divided it loosely into three, three types. What I've called accidental, but probably 
would be better known as um, unintended or spontaneous use of textiles in, in memorial culture. Um, items becoming important symbols, but actually uh, not in and of themselves particularly valuable or important. And then planned memorials, whether that's by the mourners or as a communal activity of a community or by artists on behalf of a community or artists approaching big themes in a more abstract way. And towards the end of the, the, the presentation, I'll move into to my work and how I'm looking at it. I'm slightly concerned because I'm seeing a lot of chat saying no photos. There should be a photo now coming up on the next slide. Can everyone see a red handkerchief? Yeah, we can see that, Lulu. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And yeah, some of them there are just bullet points, but I'm just I was just concerned if no one was seeing any images at all. Um, this red handkerchief is not the original red handkerchief, I have to say, um, as you will hear from the story. There was a man called Braio Lopez Morales who was executed by the fascists in Spain in 1945. His wife followed the truck that had his and other bodies on because she followed the trail of blood in the snow. And by some, who knows how it was permitted, but she was allowed to place a shoe and a red handkerchief under his head, just in case at any time the mass grave was disinterred and she would be able to find him again. To her, it mattered and she, she took that risk of asking and she could so easily have been punished for that. In 1956, the mass grave was exhumed and she found him because his shoe and the fragments of that red handkerchief were found under his head. And it was a way in which his individual identity within that mass grave was, was reinstated for her and for the family. She had to hide the evidence until the 70s um, when Franco finally was out of power because it wasn't the story that could be told. Uh, but she had her husband back in some sense and it gave her some peace. I have the next slide, please. I'm sure many of you have visited the Foundling Hospital up in Coram Fields. Um, their textile their collection of textiles wasn't set up for memorial, it was set up as a system for recognition and reunion in a time when the majority of the population were non-literal, literate rather, they used textiles as identifiers. So when a mother brought a child to the foundling hospital, their clothing was catalogued, you can just see the, the list behind the top left hand piece. Um, and then they would give, the mother would give something that she kept back part of. Um, so perhaps a fragment of clock, cloth or a little charm or, or something so that if she could come back, she could identify, they could identify her child and they could be reunited. Of course, given infant mortality at the time, they have become memorials because most children didn't survive. Uh, in the period from 1741 to 1760, there were 16,282 babies or small children admitted. 152 were reclaimed. Now, some of that doesn't mean all of the rest died, but they, they, weren't, they weren't reclaimed. And if you ever do go to the Foundling Hospital. It's absolutely heart stopping when you see the display of these textiles against, uh, against the wall or in the cases and you just see the sheer volume of children and the hopeless love that was being given when they were given up 
to the hospital. Can I have the next slide, please? I mentioned earlier about ordinary everyday objects assuming importance because of what they represent. And I'm showing you two examples here. Um, the public, private mementos rather, becoming monumental in, not in a physical sense, but in a metaphorical sense. On the right hand side, you see a little dress it was owned by a little girl called Lola Rhine. She was hidden in that dress for three years during, during the Second World War. And then because of the sort of shame that goes that went along with being a survivor of that period, she kept that dress hidden from everybody for 50 years. On the left, you see a little green cardigan, um, which belonged to Christina Scheiger. And I must apologize, Christina should be spelt with a Y. My spell checker corrected it and I didn't spot that it had wrongly corrected it. So I do apologize. Christina wore that little cardigan as she was hidden in the sewers of Lvov. And again, it was hidden for a long time, but they're both now in um, Holocaust Memorial Museums and they've developed a huge significance because in a sense, they represent each and every child who was hidden or in more importantly, perhaps, who was lost during that dreadful time. And so they've come to mean way more than being a little dress or a little cardigan. If you want to know more about the shame of survivors and how survivors were sometimes treated um, when, they, when they got to Israel um, or other communities, then the Yad Vashem website is really interesting um, for stories of people and why they kept their stories secret for so long and didn't tell anyone. And it wasn't entirely to do with, with trauma. It was to do with how, how they were treated. And that's an interesting study in itself. Uh, next slide, please. This is another accidental uh, remembrance textile. It's a tapestry woven by the Swedish born Norwegian tapestry weaver called Hanna Royen. And it's called We Are Living on a Star and it was about being human. And it hung in the government offices in Oslo. It was, those offices were bombed by a right-wing terrorist in 2011, and the tapestry was very badly damaged. It was conserved, but deliberately conserved so as to leave a scar on the bottom right-hand corner, which you can't see here, but on the real thing you can. It was left deliberately, excuse me, to commemorate those who died in the blast and the young people who the terrorists went on to murder on the island. And you'll all remember that story. And it, it's left deliberately. I, I'm not sure what signage there is, but the, the reminder of that day is inherent in the tapestry. If I can have the next slide, please. Moving on to planned deliberate uh, textile, remembrance textiles. Now this is Six Prayers by Annie Albers, which was commissioned for the Jewish Museum in New York in 1965. And there's a detail uh, on the bottom left. Annie Albers, a weaver, was really interested in how you could say things without using words. She developed this system of thread hieroglyphs. And as some of her biographer Feeney wrote, these pieces are conducive to meditation. It, the set of hangings, has a palpable silence. Yet the panels not only elicit prayer, they are a prayer evoking loss and sorrow through their woven strands. And this photograph I took um, when it was on display in the Tate Modern uh, two years ago, I think it was. And it was a very, very busy exhibition. But when you went into the room where these were hanging, you didn't see the sign, but people were still and they sat and they looked. And it really did um, 
a pa have a palpable silence, which came as a real surprise to me. If I can have the next slide, please. Here we see two examples of AIDS quilts made by the families of people who have died of AIDS. On the right, you can probably guess it's Washington DC. On the left is the British AIDS quilt, which is stored in East London somewhere, I believe. I saw it on uh, Craftivism with Jenny Eclair, which I would recommend as a, if you wanted to catch up uh, on iPlayer. It's an example of, of communal making. The large panels, I think they're six feet by three, each individual panel, um, to be roughly coffin sized. They incorporate keepsakes and clothes of the deceased. I think they were made in many other countries, but particularly in the US and the UK. And they are so large that I don't think they've ever been seen again in their entirety, you only ever see groups of panels at any one time, but they are incredible. The love and the sorrow which is poured out in each stitch, in each piece of glue, in each piece of glitter, in each stitched on memento, uh, it has huge impact. And I hope it will soon be possible to exhibit again. If I could have the next slide, please. Peter Carney, who made this particular banner, he makes all the banners for the COP um, at where Liverpool, do you know, I don't know, it's Anfield Road, is it? Where Liverpool play? <laughs> I don't know about football. This is actually the second version of the banner he made in honour of the people who died in Hillsborough. Um, the first was used so much and was made so quickly and spontaneously that it's actually having to be conserved it can't be shown in public any longer, it's too fragile. Again, he uses keepsakes, he uses textile from the people in the original one. Um, you can see a scarf, the away, there's a away strip dangling there. And this idea of, of making something that will, be, will go on being used, will go on helping people to remember and mourn of course, being a limited number of names, it is possible to have the names actually inscribed on the banner in a way that obviously isn't possible for something like six prayers where thread hieroglyphs are really the only way you can make any attempt at putting names. If I can have the next slide, please. This is your challenge those of you who live near Tower Hamlet Cemetery Park, to go and find this particular gravestone. Uh, the reason I photographed it is that um, I have a friend, Katie Russell, who is another tapestry weaver, who has worked for several years now on commemorating the Arctic convoys of the Second World War and the Jutland, the Battle of Jutland. And that's why I photographed it because uh, of this young man, Gilbert Henry, who died at the Battle of Jutland. She sees weaving as, as a meditation and honouring their privations and their loss. Weaving is, to many, many of us, an inherently meditative practice. It is so slow, you get lost in your own time. And as part of that, it allows you to, to think about the people you're commemorating if you're making some sort of memorial work and you're holding a space for them in a way that is really quite powerful. If I could have the next slide, please. Beverly Ailing Smith uh, happens to be one of my supervisors <laughs> because she's working on uh, on grief as I am. She's exploring the universal universality of loss, grief and mourning through the use of really humble textiles such as bed sheets. As you can see here, there are whole bed sheets in the piece to the left where they're, they're hanging up and fragments which have been stitched back together with, with letters, found letters from someone who's died. 
her on the right hand side. And she re uses bed sheets because as she said, you know, the bed and, and where, what bed sheets cover, it's the site of, of conception, of birth, um, of sickness and of death, all human life is there as it was. And you've got, you've got staining and use and wear and tear and all sorts of things. And her practice is using slow stitch, just as Katie uses weaving. Beverly uses slow stitch as a meditation on the journey through grief. And as loss is visibly repaired, it's acknowledging the fact that nothing is ever quite the same. And although you, you move on, you move on with the memories, happy and sad. You don't move on and leave the person behind. And she also employs what she calls sense memory. We all know what textile feels like. So when we see it in a gallery, we can have some idea of what it would feel like, even if we're not allowed to touch it, which makes it so powerful. We all know what bed sheets are. We know about the stains. And so we can have a, a, a connection more readily than with perhaps something like a painting. May I have the next slide, please? This is a project um, by an artist called Rob Hurd called Shrouds of the Song. He had a, a really bad road traffic accident, which um, left him unable to, to, to carry on doing his, his normal work. And he's, he became really interested in marking the sheer volume of numbers of soldiers who were killed on the Somme and finding a way to do that. Each of these figures, um, which are just done by number and date of death rather than name, um, each is an action man type figure posed and then wrapped in calico. And he has made, and he hasn't subcontracted this, he has made every single one 72,396 figures. Um, they've been exhibited in Bristol and Salisbury and in 2018 they were in Olympic Park at Stratford and you can see there some soldiers laying out the soldier figures because the sheer numbers mean that when he does an installation he does have to have help even though he's had no help in the making. Um, I didn't see it but I'm imagining that some of you might have done as you live more locally than I do. Just that repetition, like with the poppies cascading from the Tower of London, just the sheer numbers is hugely moving and effective. The next slide, please. I'm going to go back through some of the work I did doing my masters um, before I move on to current work, because it, it is all related and what got me interested in this. Um, I think we all probably know at least some part of John Donne's Meditation 17. Uh, it's the for, where for whom the bell tolls comes from. But the line I'm particularly drawn to is each man's death diminishes me because I am part of mankind. And the idea that we are all related, that there is a fabric of humanity, that if somebody is hurt, then I ought to feel it. And that was what got me into, uh, into the subject, really. And it's this idea of, of textile can be such a, a strong metaphor and a, a helpful and a, a, a metaphor that people can connect to very easily. When you think of public and hidden, the front and the back of, of a piece of fabric or something you stitched, uh, I've subverted it here because I hung it up so you could see the back as well. You think of unraveling, you think of tearing, you think of decaying, you think of things which are uncanny, fragile. This is actually a, a pieta, it's based on the um, upright pieta of Michelangelo. And it's actually, I took a photograph of myself holding a, a, a friend of mine who was able to be a dead weight. And I then took the image from that photograph. The one on the right, I buried it for three years just to see what would happen with decay and whether you could still see the image. 
On the left, it's displayed at, at West Dean College in the grounds, and on the right, it's in Chichester Cathedral. But in both cases, the fact that it was textile made it have an impact in a way it wouldn't have done if, had it been a painting, which came as a surprise for, to me. And that's what set me off on this whole research trajectory. If I could have the next slide, please. In 2017, I did a residency in Portsmouth and I was each day I was making a tiny tapestry. These are just two inches, uh, two and a half inches, five centimeters square in a box with a little book which describes the inspiration. Uh, and they rose out of a, a small study I did based on the, the, the man who was killed by the Spanish fascists, the idea of red decaying through the soil, which is why I use soil colours in these. I don't have that tapestry anymore, someone bought it. And I didn't take a photograph of it, which was a mistake. On the left, you can probably just see it says Defence of the Islands. Uh, it's about the three forces and the home front, their carrots growing in the bottom right of that set of four. And that goes back to a line in Eliot's poem, Defence of the Islands, where he says, we took up our positions in obedience to instructions in the idea of that quiet home-based heroism of putting up with rationing, of living with powdered egg and all that sort of thing. Top right is in memory of nuclear test veterans. So that's about a group of people as a memorial to them in the grounds at Portsmouth Cathedral, a forgotten group of heroes. Those who were, without really knowing what was going to happen to them, were put within range and suffered great sickness as a result of the radiation. So that's a nuclear fireball in two inches square. And then the one at the bottom is for Father Michael Judge, who was the first noted casualty of 9-11. He was a fire service chaplain and he ran in with the fire service to help people. And he was the first casualty who was named and numbered after 9-11. And there's a photograph of him being carried out you know, by the emergency services and their high vis and a single uh, civilian in a blue shirt, which is why I chose those particular colours. And then the little booklet describes something about him and about his death and his life. It's about, in making those, it was about holding a space. They each take about an hour, an hour and a half to make. And it's, it's holding a space for the memory of a person, respecting the memory. I made a lot of them for people who just came in and told me their stories and they took them away. And I don't have photographs of those because it was just for them. It was our gift to them. I have next slide, please. Um, sorry, I've just had a low battery warning. <laughs> I mentioned at the beginning that I'm, I'm really rather fond of uh, structural forms. I like the idea of, of structure and the mathematical possibilities of taking something flat and drawing it up and creating something three dimensional for it, from it. And I've done a lot of, of work on how you might make that happen. And this is one of the shrines, I call them, that I've, I've made this. Um, again, it's going back to slight uncanniness because from a distance they look like ceramic or stone and then you get close up and you see that they're textile and it confuses people. And to me that mirrors something of the confusion of grief that you've been parachuted into an alien landscape and you don't know where you are or who you are or what's going on. And something of that uncanniness I want to, to depict through my work. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? Um, one of the things I'm particularly interested in is, is grieving losses other than by death and ways that you can help people with that particular grieving journey. Um, and within that, disenfranchised grief. What do you do when you're not supposed to grieve something? And in thinking about that, I came up with this maquette on the left-hand side 
and you can see how that's developed. The actual maquette is 20 centimeters tall. And on the far right, you can see my studio assistant inspecting the full size cartoon. And then you can begin to see the work in progress on my loom. Um, if I lean over, you can probably see it live behind me, but that is, and this is what I've called memorial, a memorial pillar. Title of my thesis is um, going to be weaving as a meditation on and evocation of lost narratives. And it's the idea that I respond to people's stories and create something that can, can go out into the landscape and be used partly to set apart a space from mourning and helping people on their mourning journeys. Not cemeteries, uh, unconventional mourning spaces. Um, I quite like Neolithic, Neolithic stone circles and places like that. Places that have a history of some sort of spiritual human interaction without being to a specific religion. Um, and I think that makes them more potentially more, more general. Um, in this case, this is destined to be right next to a main road. There's a set of nine stones in place in Dorset. And the idea that um, it's hard to get to, you'll see it in a flash, you might not see it at all, is important to the concept of the piece. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, this is a maquette for a series of panels that I'm planning. They, they'll be about six feet high. I always make maquettes in paper and ink and, and all sorts just to try ideas out. Um, and this, they will be textile and I might make some in perspex as well, but the, they're limited to six feet high because of the width of my loom. But there's an additional metaphor going on here of, of, of holes of fra um, fragmented memory, perhaps. As I say, I'm a chaplain to older people and people living with dementia and the gaps in people's memory and how they, they navigate that and still have something real. And the emotions are there, even if the memory, they can't remember exactly what is triggering the emotion and how that can be depicted in cloth. And also matters of hidden and revealed and what happens if you kneel down and look through the holes or stand up or bend over. And I hope that when it's done, that will, will go into a place called Knowlton Church, um, which is a ruined church in a stone circle in Dorset. And the last slide, please. Um, these are my, my contacts. Um, I have my own Lulu Morris site and Twitter and everything, but actually the one that's related to my research is griefscapes underscore research or on Twitter, it's at griefscapes. Um, this is the term I've, um, I use. There are, the people refer to deathscapes in the literature or consolationscapes, but griefscapes wasn't taken. And because I'm particularly interested in losses other than by death, um, it was it was good that I could nab that particular name for my research. So if you would like to follow or tell me your stories of loss and journeys through loss, um, subject to the Ethics Committee at University, I would love to hear them. And if you want to see more generally, my website, Half Understood, uh, Blogspot rather, is, is, is there that you could have a look. And just in case you think I'm always... Um, covered in gloom and despondency, given the subject matter and the, my day job, I laugh an awful lot. <laughs> and this is a certificate that hangs over my loom, which I got from, um, well, I made the certificate, but the title comes from a Victoria Wood sketch about the general fettlers and warp and weft adjusters, um, which actually is a real union, apparently, from the, from the um, cotton mill days in Manchester but it always makes me smile when I come into my studio. So I've spoken for rather longer than I anticipated and I do apologize, um, but thank you very much for your kind attention. Mm -hmm.